My name is Selena Garafino, and I am the founder and the creator of the Evolve Method. The Evolve Method is the result of 20 some years of my personal practice, almost 15 years of teaching, and over six years of running yoga teacher trainings. This program is anchored in classical yoga studies, personal development coaching with licensed professionals, and modern movement research. This really embodies what it is to be part of the Evolve Method. Our programs are systematic. Your 200-hour teacher training is a program that sets you up with all the kinesiological, the anatomical knowledge, the foundation of yoga history and philosophy, as well as a very strong anchoring in modern movement research and functional anatomy. And then out of that, when you learn this basic sequencing structure and this capacity to teach vinyasa, hatha yoga, and restorative yoga, you're able to build on that in our advanced programming, which teaches things like the energetics of asana, um, tantric teachings on mythology and embodying conscious myth in your teachings and in your practice. The program also has a ton of modern movement that comes to us from different mobility systems and joint health systems so that you can truly practice for longevity. We named this program the Evolve Method because it's about more than a physical practice. It's about you learning to navigate better every single area of your life to be the author of your story and your destiny, to live out your dreams, and to bring your medicine to the world and really be able to serve. I'm so excited to uh, give this offering to you, and I hope you'll consider joining us either online or in person. Okay. So welcome to class. We're going to do a Katona restorative practice, which is a little different than when I teach yin yoga or more traditional um, yoga asana restorative class, because we come at it from the perspective of reformation. Like how can we reform um, the pieces of ourselves, get more access to ourself and up our longevity instead of laying in our habits, if you will. Because oftentimes when we go to do restorative practice, we're... Um, reinforcing patterns that we already hold in the body and we're kind of collapsed on ourselves. So there'll be a couple moments where I'll ask you to do a little bit of active stuff, but primarily um, it'll be uh, more gentle uh, overall. So we are going to start in a supported backbend. And I always like to start in a supported backbend because um, we already spend so much of our time hunched over and hanging over ourselves, rounded at a desk, and to be able to bring the lungs forward and come into our potential a little bit first. So how I just set up my blocks for, uh, uh, for reference, we'll be doing a supported Baddha Konasana. I like to take three blocks on their highest height across my mat which my blocks are all different sizes, which is interesting. And then one flat on its lowest height and then one on its highest height for my head, like so. So three blocks, the long on their highest height across one here. And then I like to use a strap around my feet. So again, if you don't have that many blocks at home, you could put a bolster under your back. There's other ways that you can, um, make this situation happen. I'm gonna show you how to set up and then I'll go around and help those of you in the room. So in Baddha Konasana, I like to bind my feet up and my knees. You can also place blankets under the knees. So I'm gonna take um, my strap and weave it around my sacrum, around my back. And then it's gonna go around the bottoms of my feet and I'm gonna clip it. So this is one way that you can clip the strap. And this is why I like these self-clippable straps. It's very easy to tighten things up. Um, you can also crisscross your straps, which is to take it over the top of the feet and then make this X shape like so. All of you in the room, I'll come around and help you. Um, the cross feels more secure if you're someone like me that's hyper flexible in your hips that you have laxity in the hip, the cross is gonna give you more. But if you don't need all of that, it's just around the sacrum and around the bottoms of the feet, like so, down the inner thighs. That's right, Sierra. And then uh, from here, you're gonna place these blocks so that the top of the shoulder 
the collar collarbone is at the top of the blocks and this will be our position if this feels too high underneath of the hands you can even put blankets or blocks underneath of your hands so we'll come here for our first shape supported back bend. And again, you could put a bolster under your back. I like the blocks where they are here because it's really putting pressure into the back of the lung. Good. And I'm gonna come around the room and help some of these that are here, but just to show you too, you can always place blankets underneath of the knees especially again, if one, if you're very high, the knees are very high because of restriction in the hips or two, again, if you're like me and you're prone to some hyperlaxity in the hips, you want to provide as much support as possible. Good. And the strap around the feet as well will help you to keep good contact between your feet. And anywhere where there's contact in the body, there's circuitry and connection. If you want, you can use one of mine. They're much, well, now you're all in, but they're, they're much easier. And when you're coming to rest in these poses, you really want to think that your armpits are coming towards your heart so that you're opening up and broadening the back of the scapula. So I'm going around the room right now and I'm just gonna take an armpit and pull there. Does that feel better? This one right this one right here i can see it no it's not hard to see i am not a witch it's very obvious <laughs> is that better and it probably doesn't feel like it, but your chest is level now. Isn't that funny? Our neurology will sometimes lie to us about what we learn. Good. You look happier too. <laughs> That's nice. Good. Okay. So I always start any kind of restorative practice that I'm doing with a back bend because I want to make the front body more available. And the front body is our potential. And so as we take the time to open up that front body. It's like throwing open the windows to your house. I've been talking to you about your body as a house as this magical abode that you occupy and live in. And when we come into a posture like this, we're working to open up the, the lungs, which are the windows of our house. And we're also working with the liver in this posture, which is connected to your neurology. So it's your vision. And again, this is mystical dialogue, not medical dialogue, but it's your ability to see out into the world. So <clears throat> we open up the windows and we're doing some house cleaning so that our vision outward is better. Oh. 
a new and every time that we come into a pose like this and we renew the hunch in the back the hump in the back which is the memory the hard memory that's behind us then this posture into a personal ring another option here with the arms if you wish is sometimes i'll take a frame for part of my pose up over my head opposite palm to opposite elbow and I don't stay there the whole time, but I'll make a frame for a little bit to really stretch myself out. If you have restrictions in your shoulders, that might not be available to you. But every time you come into this shape, you can think that you're offering yourself a, a personal spring. And so playing with that idea now, I want you to deepen your breath and counting the breath is really helpful because we do poses until we're done with them, not until we're bored or until it feels good, but to a measure and a count. Because when we put a count on things, we're accountable and we get to practice accountability. So we do things until we're done. So we set a commitment, we make a promise to ourselves we can keep. And then we linger there for that amount of time because all stories that are well-written have a solid beginning, a middle, and an end. So I want you to drop into your breath now and inhale for four, retain the breath for a pause, exhale for four, and stay empty of air for a pause. And really start to count the breath and allow the in-breath to go in all the way down into the low belly, Again, really opening up the windows. Let it be expansive in the upper chest and the collarbones. Put your imagination and your mind into the shape so that you can occupy more of yourself, which is ultimately the goal. So body is a house. It's got nine rooms and three floors. Most of us occupy certain parts of our house really, really well. So you might be someone who's really in your legs and your hips. You have a good ground of being. You're stabil stable and tenacious. And some people live very well on the second floor of their house. Their capacity, their arms, their hand, their back, they get stuff done. And then there's people that live up in their head and they're visionary. But if you're overly occupied in vision, you won't have the tools to manifest and create anything. So someone like that needs to practice being in the lower body. And sometimes we can be so in the lower body that we have no vision. And so even though we have all the tenacity to get things done, we don't step into our leadership. And so we need to play with capacity and ground of doing. And these poses create a reformation for ourselves, where we can really play with the breath and the imagination and the mind and start to occupy more of ourselves. So if you don't tend to go into the upper lungs, to the front of the body, to the potential, here you get to play with that. For the last few minutes, I want you to start to play with the breath of the seasons. So every time you inhale from your parents, anus and the sex organs, inhale up the front of you to the space between your eyebrows and your mind. Use your imagination and make a big arc around yourself, a half an arc. And then hold the breath at the top of every inhale and imagine summer's ripening in the harvest of summer. And then every exhale, picture the other half of that arc going down your back from the back of the head back down to the perineum, to the tailbone, and this is fall. And at the bottom of every exhale, pause for a moment and be empty of air and imagine winter. So we're always playing the spin of time. And we're always playing the spin of the seasons. We're always orienting ourselves in time and space. And we get to mediate time. There's people who get up in the middle of the night to go to work. There's night owls. 
and there's early risers. What game you want to play? So for three more breaths. Breath of the seasons, three more breaths. And now if you hate it, you could speed up the breath and take three fast breaths and play time that way. And if you love a restorative backbend, you can slow the breath down and linger here. And this is one of the ways in which we are powerful. So as you breathe, know you're reflecting on the memory behind you in the back body every time you breathe down the back. And you're potentiating every time that you pay attention to the in-breath rising up the front, your personal spring. A restorative backbend is where we go when we want to participate out into the world, when we want to open up the front of ourselves to be in community. Very good. We're going to transition out of this shape now. Please go slow. You can unclip your strap. I like to undo my strap with my hand without having to sit up. Another selling point of self-clippable straps. <laughs> and I kind of like to roll over to one side off of my blocks that you can sit up how you wish. And then just notice how you feel now. So part of what we were doing is there's a frame in the torso. There's frames all over in the body. Body is geometry. So one frame you have is shoulder, shoulder, hip, hip. Right? It's kind of a rectangle or a square, depending on how your body is built. You have a rectangle or a square. And when you have, anytime you have a frame, a frame is a portal, just like a sphere. So we're pulling in that restorative back bend, the chest through the portal of the torso. We're pulling the lungs through the portal, opening that window, making ourselves a little more available. So we're going to play with a little bit of heat in the body, even though it's restorative because heat builds pliancy, right? If you want to bend metal, we have a jeweler in the room right now. You guys can't see her, but there's a jeweler in the room. She can't bend cold metal, right? It needs pliancy first. And so they, um, they either hammer things, right? Which builds friction, which starts to create some pliancy or you heat things to solder them together, right? So we need pliancy in the body. And so we have to turn our personal fires on. In Taoism and Chinese medicine, there's three fires in the body. The first fire is down in your pelvic floor. Um, it's the basement of your house. It's food, sex, money, water. It's your endocrine system. And the second fire is the fire of the heart, which is your personal abode. It's where you have your community and your communication and your speech. It's where you articulate out of the heart. And then the third fire is the imagination. So we're gonna come on to all fours and we're gonna make a really good frame for ourselves. So how you know that something is at 90 degrees is to measure it. So um, Abby, my teacher jokingly says, we don't do poses to our feelings, we take a measurement. So the blocks aren't gonna stay here, but I'm gonna use the blocks to measure 90 degrees. Cause for me, I always think when my knee is back like this, that I'm at 90. I'm like, I'm at 90 degrees and I'm not. So you'll know because your back of your forearm will come flush to the block and your knee will come flush to the block. And that's a true 90 degrees. So measure it and then you can set the block aside and measure that your hip distance apart. If you spin your hands in, when your middle fingers are touching, that's exactly shoulder distance apart because your body is a math equation and then spin the hands back forward. And now when you look back, those should be right in line with your knees because your shoulders and your hips, the bones are the same distance. It might not appear that way, right? Because we can have different musculature around the shoulders. Good, and now I really want you to spread the tops of the feet onto the floor. And you'll feel when you spread the tops of the feet onto the floor that it gets a little lighter and a little more buoyant in the hands. 
And from here, I want you to find the spreads throughout the body. So imagine that the tops of your feet were like cream cheese being spread on a bagel or whatever you like and spread the whole top of the foot. And imagine that it's like a plug in a socket. So as you're spreading the top of the foot, it's like you're pulling up information from the socket of the earth. So you have that connection to ground below. And then rather than staring at your navel, which we probably do enough of metaphorically, right? Navel gazing, take the gaze slightly forward so you're potentiating yourself. And in the same way that you spread the top of the foot, spread the knee. When there's pain in the knee, it's usually in poses like this, it's usually because the feet are not anchored correctly. And then find that same spread across the sacrum in your mind and then spread the collarbones and then find the hands. So if we find one piece of ourself, we can then apply it to everywhere because every body part has a corresponding part. So find all the frames in the body. So right wrist to left shoulder, left wrist to right shoulder, right shoulder to left hip, left hip, or pardon me, left shoulder to right hip. Find those X's all over in the body and spread them. Good, and we'll play now with the portal of the lungs once again. So inhale and round your back, which is the opposite direction that we normally go. And then exhale and draw the chest through the portal of the shoulders and back bend. And inhale round and exhale, pull it through. So I want you to take a bit of a bus streak of breath here. A bus streak of breath is a bellows breath. So we forcefully inhale and forcefully exhale and do it a little bit faster than you normally do, moving primarily from the pelvis. So we're stoking the first fire of the body. Keep going, heating yourself up so we can change the body's chemistry. So you can think when you're doing this that it's like you're preheating your oven in your house. So you need things to get nice and hot. So you wanna speed it up a little bit, inhaling as you round and exhaling as you go out. If you think about yoga and pranayama and breath work, it's alchemical work. So we're playing with chemistry and with our hormone systems and our glands and our organs. And if you wanna bake something, if you wanna change your chemistry, cookies, for example, come from a liquid form and then they turn into a sphere, uh, like a half sphere. Angel food cake is a fluffy batter, but then it turns into a cake that is light and fluffy and tall, but it requires a specific pan and a specific temperature. So as we're doing something like this, we're agitating ourselves to create a chemical reaction. <laughs> So if you're a little bit annoyed by this, I'm not gonna lie, it's meant to be that way. We have to agitate ourselves in the right way, seduce ourselves in the right way, heat ourselves up in the right way so that you can change the body's chemistry. And that's what we're doing. We're getting some heat in the body, in the system to make the joints more pliant. And this is something I often do at the very beginning of my practice. And if you're feeling frisky, you can let it get a little bit wild and maybe even go for a ride down a hill on your bicycle and let it get really fast. Should be starting to feel some heat in the body if you're pumping the breath, yes, and moving the pelvis. Nice, pause at the center, take a deep breath in. Hold your breath, look forward, and then exhale. Good, you can keep the legs just as they are if this is not available to you, or you can cross your right leg in front of your left in Gomukhasana. So it's up to you, not everyone has this available to them in their hips. So you can take cow face pose in the knees, or you can keep the feet hip distance apart as you wish. And then we're gonna put a spin on the wrists because the wrists are a collarbone. And again, if you can't tell, we're playing with the lungs. So take your right wrist and flip it all the way around and take your left wrist and flip it all the way around. And this is really good for your wrists. It's uncomfortable in the beginning if it's new to you because you lack bone density and probably because you haven't been stretching your wrists in potentially 30 years, right? Or 50 years or 20 years whatever it is. What I do wanna say is this comes from the shoulder externally rotating. It doesn't come from spinning the lower arm. It's from taking the armpit towards the heart all the way around. If I try to let it come from the lower arm, my wrist is only gonna go this far. Do you see that? 
this is not external rotation. My shoulder is still internally rotated. Look at the difference between my right and my left shoulder. Do you see? So usually when people can't get it all the way around, it's because they're not externally rotating from the shoulder. And then the more you spread the top of the feet, the more this will get light in the hands. So spread the lungs, take your lungs through that big portal and now spin your pelvis around to the right. So we're playing with water now. When we were going forward and back, we were playing with fire, right? The element of fire, with the metaphor of fire. We use a lot of metaphors. Spinning my pelvis. Are you like, mine doesn't do that. I was just about to say actually that it's really interesting to gain information about ourselves if we, and you be mindful with your shoulder, because I know you have something different going on. Um, but when noticing if you don't know how to be in your lower body. So what I want you to imagine, Sierra, Sierra was like, I can't spin my pelvis. Imagine that there was a marker on your tailbone, very end of your butt, and now poke it up towards the sky. Good. And now go over to the left. Yep. And now tuck it under you, tuck your butt. Good. And now go over to the right. Good, and now back up to the sky. Good, now do that again. Up to the sky, over to the, there you go. And now see if you can start to smooth that out, Sierra. You're doing it. It's a little clunky, but you're doing it. <laughs> this is good information if you don't know how to be in your lower body, in the pelvis. The pelvis is water, it's your inheritance. It's your, ten, uh, like your stock, it's your hearing, it's your acoustics. So getting into the pelvis, I would bet, I can't tell right now, but I would guess that Sierra has high arches in her feet from seeing the way she's moving in her pelvis. Her alarm system is on, which is not a bad thing. These are all good things, but we need to learn how to play out of our strengths. So we're in water now. the swishing, we're spinning around ourselves. When you move to the right, it's the direction of time, spin of the planet. Good, pause in the center, take your wrist back forward. If your legs are crossed, you're gonna switch the cross of your legs. If you're on all fours with your legs parallel, this is fine. You can either just keep your fingertips forward or if you wanna play with a different grip, interlace at the webbing and place your hands under your sternum. And this is a representation of what we refer to metaphorically as the third hand. It's you mediating all the polarity within yourself. You can think it's like inside of you, there's an imaginary piece of you that mediates polarity, effort and grace, heating yourself up, cooling yourself down, being personal and being in community. So now this can be real tricky. Go the other way, Sierra, go counterclockwise. <laughs> so you have to go left first. Yep. So you could imagine that there was a clock face on your tush <laughs> and you're spinning that uh, pocket watch around to the left now, which is the direction of the lunar. You're going against the grain, it's counterculture, it's your emotive self, it's the side of the heart. Playing with water, there's a chemical reaction between fire and water, it makes steam. Then you get to be a steam engine. We talk in a lot of metaphor in yoga and myth because it's impersonal, right? Like it's, uh, it's universal. We all know what it is to live in a house. We all know what happens in a basement. We know the qualities of night and moon. We know what Saturdays are like. So we play with archetype. Good, pause, come back to the center. If you are already in the center, you'll stay here now, uncrossing the legs. And now I want you to play for just about a minute and a half between going forward and back, playing the fire, and then spinning around yourself as you wish, but play back and forth. When you go forward and back, pump the breath. And when you go around yourself, slow the breath down, play with left and right. building pliancy, moving water. Stagnant water breeds disease, right? It's where the mosquitoes live and give everyone malaria. So we wanna be able to swish our waters around. 
We don't want a musty basement. Otherwise you can't have a family room down there and bring your friends over to play a game of pool. It's musty. Good. Come back to the center and pause. We're gonna play one more moment with the flipped wrist, but just on one hand. So flip your right wrist. And I want you to bend the elbow a little bit and circle around the right wrist. So the collarbone is housing for the lungs and a lung is like a mollusk. It will fill whatever you give it, right? So a snail will fill whatever size shell. A hermit crab will grow to the size of the shell that you give it. A fish in a fish tank will not grow, but you put a goldfish in Flathead Lake, it will get gigantic and become a menace, right? So the more space you create for the lungs, the more they will plump up and fill. And then go the other way around that right wrist. Good, and then switch hands. Again, this isn't to torture you. It's just to make things more available to you. So spin around the left shoulder. Good. And you'll build bone density, change directions in the wrist as you wave the hands. There's a period of tenderness, but then they get more pliant. The joints get healthier. I used to have cysts in my wrist called ganglion cysts. I used to call them Bible cysts, synovial fluid from improper use of the wrist. I popped them and now that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> it hasn't in like 15 years. And I do push-ups like this on my hands. It's really healing. Good, back to the center. And now we're gonna open and shut a window just for a moment. So flip the right wrist and the left wrist and then the right wrist and the left wrist. And the more you spread the tops of the feet, the lighter this will be in the hands. Spread and anchor the feet. Just two more. Good, nice. Pause forward. And this is the only really active moment that you'll have in class is what we just did. And this, we're gonna take a down dog. So curl your toes under and find a downward facing dog with a little bend in your knees so that you're at a 60 degree triangle of strength, structure, and stability. There's a 60 degree angle in the hip crease. So there's a triangle fold in the hip. There's 60 degree bend behind the backs of the knees. Get your biceps right alongside of your ears, ears alongside of biceps. Push into the base knuckles of your hands, not the heel of the hand and spread the back of the thigh. Very nice, two more big breaths. Very good, lower down. Okay, we're gonna take a pigeon, a restorative pigeon. I like to have about three blankets for a pigeon. I make them the long way, like so. And put these across my mat. Everyone's gonna have a different height that they prefer. These blankets are a bit thick. I probably only need two. And we're gonna use some blocks here. So for the blocks, I'm gonna have two blocks that are gonna go underneath of my armpits for a lymphatic flush. And I'm gonna have a block for under my head. The height of these is gonna depend um, on your body. And I'll come around and help those that are in the room. There's lots of ways to enter a pigeon. Some of you in the room, when we did this the other day, you just sat down and put a leg over the top, over the front. I like to enter from a dog. I know that's not available to everyone. So you can come into your pigeon. Um, and for those of you that prefer the Sanskrit terminology, ekapada raja kapotasana, you know, that's a big mouthful. But if you want the Sanskrit, there it is. Ekapada raja kapotasana. You have to say it 10 times fast though, before you get in the post. Or half pigeon. <laughs> Pigeon, pigeon, pigeon. Yeah, <laughs> he says pigeon, pigeon. So you might just be coming in like this and sitting down into your pigeon. I like to enter from a dog. So I like to bend and lunge. So you pick how you're going to enter the shape. And then here, um, I'm going to take one block under my left armpit. 
and one block under my right armpit. And I'm gonna bring my other block under my forehead and then I'm gonna stretch my arms out into a V shape. Another V for victory, like so. And I'm really putting good pressure in my armpit into the block. The block is at a diagonal, you guys. So it's at a diagonal on my mat. It's not facing straight on. The top of the block is turning in towards the center of the mat. You can see that really visibly on the, on the screen. And that is gonna allow me to really get my armpits in to the blocks. And I'll come around and help those of you in the room. But we really wanna get the pelvis as level as possible. Put ourselves on a spit. So by put yourself on a spit, I mean from the perineum all the way through the navel center. We'll put your armpit in there. It feels weird, I know. And then you have such short arms. Well, they're not so short, but for the height of the block, I'm gonna put a block under your hand, Sierra, so you don't feel like you have to. Isn't that better? It is better. Yeah, that feels much better. <laughs> and then let's get this armpit. So there's a bunch of lymph in the armpit. Yes. There we go, is that better? Good. There's a lot of lymph in the, um, in the armpit. And so when we, a little something under here. When we push pressure here, it allows us to access that little flush. Let me give you just a little on that. You're like, I don't know. <laughs> Good. Nice. And then again, as always, I want you to come to breath. bring attention and awareness into that piece of yourself. Better? right in your armpit, <laughs> right in your armpit, she says. It's hard to do to yourself. I think I've done it enough that I kind of get it now. Actually, there, does that feel better? It might not feel, sometimes, no. <laughs> yeah, you know why? Because now we're in our habit, we're out of our habit. So uh, there. now you're level, does that feel okay? Okay. Great. You look great. I'm going to get you blocks for your hands, though, just because that might feel more supported. And then the whole armpit. Yeah. There we go. And then let's do the whole armpit there. That nice external rotation. Good. So we're gonna take a, a breath of an integrated stitch. So I told you there's nine rooms and three floors in your house. I want you to open up the thread of your imagination and go down into your perineum with your mind and inhale down into the base of the pelvis. And then exhale and in your mind, draw a line or walk up an invisible staircase all the way up to the back of your right eye. And then inhale around your back to your left armpit in your mind, all the way around the back, walk down another flight of stairs. And then exhale up to the front of your left eye, walk up a little staircase. And then inhale down into the center of yourself, right into your personal abode, right behind the heart. And then breathe down into the right sitting bone in the right leg. Good, inhale up to the right armpit. 
and go around your back, exhale all the way down to your left sitting bone. And now take a slow breath in, walk a staircase right up to the third eye center between your two eyebrows. Now 10, integrate it all and imagine there is a sphere around the whole of your body. So map the terrain again, inhale, go down into the perineum, walk down a flight of stairs. To envision a staircase up to the back of the right eye, exhale. Inhale around your back to your left armpit. Exhale to the front of the left eye, go up. Inhale down into the center of yourself, dead middle. Exhale down to the right sitting bone. Inhale up to the right armpit. Eight, go around your back to your left sitting bone. Deep breath in, up to the third eye center. And 10, put a sphere around yourself. And continue to breathe nice and steady. You mediating the seasons of the self. The fire up the back, the water down the front, the grace and the effort. You mediating the rooms of your house, your personal stitch. Just a couple more big breaths here. But it's normal to have tingling under the armpits. It's good, it's the flush. Very gently come up off of those two and set those two blocks aside, stay in the pigeon. And then walk both of your hands over to the left for a moment to 10 o'clock. So if your pubic bone was facing 12 o'clock and your tailbone was six o'clock, walk over. And then walk over to two o'clock for a moment. See what's out in the world for you. Time is always spinning. Any goal you set is in time and it's in the future. Good, and we're gonna take a spinal rotation now to the right. I'm gonna spin around so it's easier to see on the camera. So you're gonna thread, there's a couple options here, your left shoulder to the mat and rest your head on your block. And you can stay right here, just enjoying a little bit of a back of the shoulder opening, or you can put your fist in your left hand into the palm of the right hand and look all the way up to the sky in the rotation. Almost the back of my head is making contact. We won't be there too long, but a nice little spinal rotation. How high up? Yeah, you might need to flip the block up a little higher if you're depending on how close to the ground you are. Yes. Is that better? Good. Nice. We're not gonna stay in that position too long, so gently unwind out of there. So in between sides, I always like to find a frame. So you can either come to all fours, however you entered your pigeon, especially if you're someone who's up on a lot of blankets. But if you need a little more friskiness, you can clear the blanket and take a dog in between. So you can come to all fours, you can come to a seat, just something where there's neutrality in the pelvis and in the legs. And everyone's practice is different. So some of you might be sitting in Dandasana, staff pose with the legs forward. You might come to all fours and just wiggle it out. I need one of these. <laughs> So if you need a little scorpion dog, as it is known after all that external rotation, 
can roll out the hip, you could do that on all fours. Let the practice be yours. Again, you're the mediator. And then as you're ready, set up to the left side. So I'm gonna swing my left foot forward. Same thing, we'll start with the flush in the armpits. It's so good for you, especially this time of year. Well, this time of year, we're in a pandemic. I was like flu season, but you know, respiratory illnesses, things that are seasonal well-being. flushing the lymph plays with our immunity. So the same setup, this is a different hip though. So honor if you need more blankets on this side, you know? And then again, a diagonal in the blocks. So they're not facing forward. You're turning them slightly in. And then armpit, armpit, forehead, and extend out. I'm always surprised these prop things work on me because I learned them from very short people and I'm almost six feet tall. So I'm always a little surprised that I don't need 12 more blocks. I'm gonna go around the room and help set up our students in here. You, as soon as you're there, start to drop into the breath. And you can play with a few different breath practices here. You could do breath of the seasons again. There, you got it closer that time on your own. <laughs> you could play with the breath of the seasons, which we already did, which is inhaling, spring up the front body. It's always up the front because the front body is potential. Back body is always the memory. It's the hard shell behind us. I feel like you're very far over on, I don't wanna get your pretty hair. I feel like you're very dumped over on that hip. Is that okay? There, now you're level. So you can play with breath of the season, spring up the front, summer at the top, fall down the back, winter at the bottom. Another breath practice you can play with here is first polarity of nature, which is fire and water. And fire represents grace, or pardon me, your vigilance and your effort, and water is your grace and your receptivity. So you can play with the breath of fire and water. Fire on the inhale, up the back, as the breath warms as it comes into the body. And you can play with the receptivity of grace, descending down the back, down the front, being ready and willing and available. Those of you that have been doing Katona yoga for a while and you know the magic square, you can take the breath of integrative stitch that we did a few minutes ago. But put your imagination and your mind into the pose because we don't just do poses for the body, we do them to become the maestro of the mind, to attune our instrument. And we tune our personal instrument so that we can play well with others and play in an orchestra. You can just notice the tingling in the fingers from the pressure under the armpits, the flush. You want to spit that etheric tube at the center of yourself that we call spine or sushumna, the gracious stream. It's the Tai Chi, the Sutra Atman, the thread of the self. In home practice, I always do everything to account. So if I'm doing restorative, my age times two, if I'm holding for the normal play, I'll do just my breath for the number of my age.
in this way we practice holding form making good containers so that we can hold prana vitality And let's gently come up and out of there and do our little lateral side bend. So you'll have to move two of your blocks out of the way. And we'll start this time by going to 10 o'clock. So to the past, looking to the left in the direction of the feeling self of the heart, a little lateral side bend. And then spin that half circle over. Take a little walk again to two o'clock. Again, because everything's always happening in time. The goal is always in the future. So if you're on a clock face, pubis is 12 o'clock. So 10 o'clock will be to the left and two o'clock is to the right. So I always orient everything on a clock face because we're learning to spin and play with space and time all the time, right? In life, most of learning to be an adult is learning to manage your time and space, right? Because then you're powerful. <laughs> so come back to the center. Like what does a little kid do? They need mom and dad to manage their time for them. You have ballet lessons at four o'clock, right? But a calendar is personal religion. When you belong to a religion, which lots of us do, there are certain things you do on certain days, right? You go to Easter Sunday. A your calendar is your personal religion. I do this at this time. I do this at this time, right? So we organize ourselves in time and space. So now take the rotation, take the back of the right shoulder to the mat and your head to your block and put the spin on it underneath of yourself. And it's almost like you're trying to get the right eye all the way up to the sky so that you really have 360 degrees of vision around yourself. Yep, just like that. That looks very good. Time on a calendar is reflective of your personal nature and it's very empowering to have a technique, right? Calendars are communal and they're also personal. And that's what we're doing when we have a personal calendar on a community calendar. You're putting the personal into the community. Time is not linear, it's revolutionary and it's revelatory. And that's why we do things repeatedly. And we play with great nature and the polarities of great nature because that's the same for everyone. So we're playing a game we can all play. Everyone has fire and water. Everyone has winter and a spring. Good, you guys. Gently come out of the rotation. And again, a dog in all fours, a dandasana. And I've been saying this to you guys a lot, but we play with the linear, which is made up only so that we can find ways to organize the sphere better because great nature is a sphere and great nature is a circle and it's the perfect shape and it's inclusive and it's exclusive and it's concentrated and it radiates. Lines are made up and great nature holds implicit intelligence. So when we're well adjusted, we're a sphere. We're radiant and whole, and that becomes the goal of practice. Good, and let's take a supported restorative child's pose. So you're gonna take blankets for the backs of the knees in between the calf and the hamstring. And there's lots of ways to set up a supportive child's pose. So if you have a favorite way, take your favorite way. I don't mind. I'm gonna put block blankets behind my thighs with my big toes touching. I'm gonna place one block the long way down my sternum and a block under my head. And I'm gonna put two blocks out under my hands in the shape of a V. But you can take any variation that you like as long as you're creating some space, like let it be nice and spacious rather than a collapsed shape. I'm gonna put one more blanket under there. But put yourself up however you wish. You could be on a bolster. Ah, oh, there we go. 
And today for me, I'm playing up high. So I have all my blocks on this side. I have three blank my thigh and my knee. And pardon me, the calf in the back of the thigh so that I can get nice and spacious. I can be on a spit. And really put your mind into the breath because the goal of yoga has always been the mind. Before asana existed, before anyone had ever done a yoga pose, because that happened pretty recently in the history of yoga, it was about the mind. Because the yogis always knew the bodies fall apart. Some of us have already experienced that. Some of us started experiencing fall apart moments very young. And some of us are very fortunate to have the right genetics and lack of accidents to have a body that's holding up really well for a long time. But your breath is your life. I said to my students in their advanced teacher training this week that we're not the disciplinary of the breath, we're the disciple of the breath. If you don't believe me, hold your breath till you pass out and we'll talk about it when you wake up because your body will force the breath because life persists. It's the collective spirit moving through you into the personal. And so we learn to mediate the breath and the breath feeds the imagination. And it's this third thing that we're playing with, the mind. So we use the mind well, and the mind holds great imagination. So how do I keep my mind invested in my body and in my breath to hold it all together? We do that by playing and organizing and keeping to organize and mediating and staying effortful, even when we're in a restorative pose. So play the breath. Now begin by, we'll take something called the wraps of rapture. We'll start with fire and water effort and grace which we've already done. So inhale for fire up the back, make a sphere around yourself and exhale water grace down the front. You'll feel the breath is warmer on the inhale because the body warms the breath, the outside air and extracts nutrients from it. Through that great filtration system of the nose and the nasal hairs and the constriction in the back of the throat for that ujjayi breath, the breath of the victor, breath of the conqueror. In the water, the air is cool as it comes down the front. Let it rain down and receive grace. Keep the same pattern on the breath, but now we're going to play the stitch of time, the hours of the day. So bring your attention over to the front of your left shoulder. And this is the dawn. It's the dawning of innocence the sun rising in the east and now make a sphere around yourself to your right shoulder which is dusk sun sets and around the back of the body for night so sleep the night and seize the day and breathe around yourself playing the spin of time big slow in breaths from left shoulder to the front of the right shoulder you can picture high noon right at your sternum and lunar midnight at your spine around your back Moon set at the back of the left shoulder. Sun doesn't rise and set, but you rise and you set. And the planet keeps spinning, doing its thing. So draw a sphere around yourself front to back now. Now we'll go back into the breath of the seasons but I want you to take your attention down to your left sitting bone and let spring rise up the front of you to your right eyeball. So inhale in a sphere now from left sitting bone to right eyeball, right eyeball to left sitting bone in that diagonal sphere. And picture spring rising up the front, summer at the top, fall down the back. The cave of winter of introspection where you have an insight down at the bottom of the left sitting bone. 
now you've played grace and effort. You've played the spin of time. You're playing the spin, the pattern of the seasons. And you are at the very center of yourself behind your breastbone. That's that imaginary third hand that's mediating time and seasons. Grace and effort. Now one more sphere around yourself. Keep breathing the way that you are, but go from right sitting bone to left eye and left eye to right sitting bone in a sphere. And this we call seize the day and own the night. So enacting, stepping out into the world with your right foot, literally the idea of put your foot in it and step out and accomplish something and then rest when it's done. And if you've done all of those wraps, your whole body is in a sphere now of your own breathing, the wraps of rapture. And dead center in the middle is your soul, your you -ness. I go in, I go out. I love summer. I love fall. There's no one in there but you. It's your implicit unseen self. And you are the center of your circumference and your circumstances, and you're mediating everything. You're mediating all of this dialogue. All of these polarities. It's the third thing that creates the relationship and that's you. Take five more long breaths here. And after that last breath, gently come off of the blocks. Move slow. And we'll come to a fold. Seated forward fold. So I'm going to extend my blankets so that A little longer. I'm going to sit on three. It's up to you how many you sit on, but put yourself on a spit. I was going to use our chairs, but I don't see a lot of chairs. So I know I had you get them out, but the students don't all have them. So the little chair series I was going to do might be might be hard to teach. If you're not on a chair, do this. If you're on a chair, do this. So we're going to keep it simple for people today. Um, I like to make a boundary at my feet. And you guys that are sitting by a wall, if you want, you can plug your feet into the wall. You can spin around and face the wall. Um, but we want the feet hip distance apart. So you can measure it's two fists. And you want to get right on your perineum. Again, the perineum is the place between the sex organs and the anus. Um, I gave you guys all a self-clippable strap. If you want to, I can hand you one. If you want to strap yourself in um, so that you can adjust yourself and give yourself support so it's less work. Um, this is difficult to do if you don't have a self-clipping strap. So if you don't, you can ignore that piece of the instruction, but I'm going to give it to those in the room. So I'm on a spit right now from my perineum up to the crown of the head which really allows the spine to lift and rise and the diaphragm to move easy. You can feel when you have a plug in a socket versus if you're slumped back in the sitting bones. And when I come forward into my fold, if your hip distance apart, your knees will actually make really good contact with your armpits. And then you can wiggle your butt back to deepen it. But I'm gonna take my strap and I'm gonna put it over my back. And I like to have the tail pointing down because it's easier to tighten it up, but I'm gonna clip it. I'm gonna spin it around and I'm gonna tighten up the strap. 
around my upper middle back because then I don't have to work so hard and we are um, really good at overusing our back. So if you're facing a wall, you're just using the wall to um, give yourself a point of contact, a boundary for the feet. And then I'm gonna take two blocks under my head because I'm not very oldy today. Every day is so different. And I'm holding on to my heels like a ball in a mitt. I'm gonna go around and help these guys in the room. You come into your fold. And really drop into your breath, you guys. Just keep breathing. I'm gonna get you on your chair again. I want you to bend your knees and hug your feet. Bend them as much as you need to in this back posture. Pat bar a little bit better. I'm gonna pick you up, I promise you're fine. Do you trust me? <laughs> bend your knees. Yeah, there, do you feel that? Yeah, grab your heels even now. Yeah, good. Do not change your position. Don't straighten your leg. Don't change your position. Don't straighten your leg. That is so much better already. Does that feel different? And then again, to do things to a measure and account because some of us hate forward folds and this is tight and it's uncomfortable and some of you love it, right? So I want you to take 10 breaths, which means if you hate it, you can breathe a little faster or you can savor it.
I know some of you are nearing the end of your 10 breaths. When you come up, I want you to lengthen from your pubis all the way through the crown of the head with a flat back to sit up on the blanket. And you can unclip your strap at your side. You'll just reach over and clip it. Good, nice. And then stay upright in your seat once you come up with the knees bent. We'll put a little spin on it. So take a nice big rotation over to the right, left hand to the outside of the right knee. Spin back around yourself. Imagine, or it might even happen that you are trying to get your left eye behind you. You can also laugh at the idea of your left eye getting all the way behind you. <laughs> Good, and then go the other way. So spin yourself on a spit, right hand to the outside of the left knee, turning around yourself 180 degrees. Good. And then back to the center and let some of the, the tension out. Wiggle out your feet. All right, we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of foot love and then we're gonna do pranayama. So you're just gonna sit cross-legged. Hopefully you're not weird about touching your own feet. I'm not making you do this to anyone else, just to yourself. You're gonna sit however it's comfortable that you can get a hold of your right foot. Um, I want you to wiggle your fingers in between your right toes. You don't have to sit how I am. And then spread your toes. And if you have foot problems, this is going to be uncomfortable. Yeah, best you can. Someday they might, the webbings will connect. Maybe. If you've been wearing boots all your life. I'm not looking at anyone in particular who probably <laughs> has to wear boots at work all the time. <laughs> and you can flip the top of the foot forward and back too, like so. And you can roll out the ankle. And again, you might be sitting like this. This might be better for some of you, like sit however it's comfortable for you. I am not expecting you to sit in half lotus to work on your feet. <laughs> Good, okay, now take your left thumb and put it right in the center of the ball of your foot, right in the center. And this might be a little uncomfortable. This is right in the, in between this part of the arch. So you have an arch here, you have an arch here and you have an arch here. There's three arches in the feet. We're playing, this is called your transverse arch if you want the fancy anatomy term but you'll dig into the transverse arch with your left thumb. And this can be tender sometimes, by the way. So if there's tenderness there, you might even just hold pressure on the tenderness. So everything in the foot like is reflected everywhere else. So when I do body readings, I can read a foot, read a face, read a hand, you know, but I often will read the feet because it's just easier. But so the head is the ball of the toe right here. The ball of the foot right here is your lung. This is the lung. This is the kidney, so I can see kidney function and whatnot here. And this is your pelvis, your heel, reproductive organs. It's literally your butt, right? And then the top of the foot is your spine. So working with the feet is really effective. Now take your other hand and massage that arch from, this is like your lower back right above the heel. And that might be really tender up to the lung. Sometimes I do this before I practice yoga at the beginning so that I can really feel like I'm standing well on my two feet. This is good for my jujitsu players because <laughs> we cramp up our feet and do different, we use our feet a lot. Good, and then just any little final movements on that, but really spread the toes. It might be uncomfortable if that's not a game you play very often, but spread the toes. Good, and then extend both legs for a moment and spread them. It's usually kind of weird because even that little bit, like my right foot's working better than my left. I like can't quite spread the left ones as far. Isn't that weird? It's so funny. It shows you how important it is to switch legs. And again, you can sit however it's comfortable. This could be propped up on a bolster. 
there, like anything, whatever you need to do to get access to your foot and then really will your right fingers in between the left toes. And then I like to start by like rolling out my wrist, playing with that joint space. All the joints in the body are associated with the kidneys. Again, this is all mystical dialogue. It's not medical, it's Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, but um, joints are kidneys. So this is why, like if you think about gout and some of these different conditions that are connected to the flushing of the body, right? And then right thumb into that transverse arch, a little, and one foot might be more sensitive than the other. That's good information, right? Most of us have a piece of ourselves that we use really well and a piece of ourselves that we kind of ignore. And this becomes problematic because our strengths become our liabilities. That's where we get overuse, right? So you can look in someone's shoes and see if they're flat footed or if they use the internal arch more, which is the part of ourself left side of the foot on both feet is the big toe side. I don't have time to explain why today, but the pinky edges of the feet are the are the heart side of the body on both feet. So the left side is how you handle your heart, which is, or the pinky side, pardon me. And the left side is how you handle the world. And it's where you take your hits. So like you might notice if you have big calluses up on the big toe, outer side of the big toe, you might be someone who overthinks. <laughs> That's me. Mine is very callous right there. <laughs> or people that have big calluses on the pinky hot side of their foot. And I tell it's like, it's where you take your hits in life. That's someone who takes their hits in their heart. Good. And then now massage up the art. And none of this is to pathologize ourselves. It's just information, bodies, um, physiology and psychology is connected, right? And the body doesn't lie. <laughs> Like we can lie and we can lie to ourselves about how we're doing and we can lie to other people. I'm fine, right? But the body doesn't lie. <laughs> Good. And then one final little moment, just kind of rolling out the ankle. Nice. And then get out of there and stretch your legs out for a moment and roll out the ankles. Good. And we're going to isolate the ankle for a moment because, um, so I don't know if you know, but your the two bones in your lower leg spiral the same way that the, almost the same way, they're a little different structure than the bones in your lower arm. So I always use this arm because I have a tattoo on it. So it's really easy to see, but supination and pronation this bone, you know, the radia and ulnar bone are spinning around each other, which is why you can still see part of my tattoo. The bones go like this and they make a spiral. Your lower leg does the same thing and it's connected to the ankle bone, but often we use the hip and the lower leg rather than isolating the ankle. So I wanna isolate your ankle. So I want you to take your left arm under your right, uh, under your right leg and grab your right bicep. And then I want you to grab the front of your knee so that you'll be able to feel if those bones are spiraling. So really isolate this. And this leg again can be wherever you want. And now I want you to lift your toes up towards your knee. This is dorsiflexion. And now try to turn just the toes out without moving your leg. Like, so you're right now, Allison, your whole lower leg is spun open. Do you see this? That's you. I want you to keep this forward and isolate the ankle. It, yes, it's small. So do you feel the difference between isolating the ankle and now take the toes down. So don't let the shin bone moon move. Circle it over to the left and back up to the start. And put a little tension on it like you were moving through mud. This is called the controlled articular rotation, an ankle car. So we're isolating the ankle joint instead of rotating through the knee and the hip. Yes, nice job. Do you feel that? Good, and then change directions. So these help to build and stabilize mobility in the ankle joint. There's a routine I do every morning called the morning routine. 
you do this through the whole body, isolating each of the joints. We'll do it one day in class. It's not actually yoga, but it's really good for your joints. Good, nice. I see you guys are not moving your shin bones on camera too. That's really good. This is good if you've sprained your ankles too. Anyone, all of us at some point. Um, Sierra, this is good for you for ankle locks and all those positions we end up in where the foot gets pushed into this position. This is good protection. Good, and then relax that and let's switch sides. So left arm will come under. I think I took you across. I'm sorry, that's very uncomfortable. I took you all the way across last time. I got confused. You can just take your left arm under your left leg. I'm so sorry. Something about looking in the camera. It, I think I made you go like this. Yeah, that's like extra effort. I'm so sorry. Just take your left arm under your left leg and grab your right bicep. I was like, why does everyone look so contorted? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sometimes between the camera and the live bodies, I get confused. <laughs> so really isolate this and put some muscular tension on it. So I want you to think that the air just got thicker in the room and then go over to the left and down and around without moving the shin. And you'll feel if you let the shin bone start to rotate, it's gonna be a much smaller movement when it's isolated in the ankle. Good, yeah. Much smaller movement and then reverse it. Lots of snap, mine too. I get lots of cracking when I do my morning cars should hear my hips first thing in the morning when I do my morning cars and then my shoulder good and you should feel a little bit of muscular tension nice and then let that go I usually do about five in each direction okay so we're gonna breathe for the last bit of class you can sit on blankets um, I do want your pelvis higher than your knees. I'm gonna sit in Varasana in a block because it feels okay to me. But if that causes you any kind of discomfort, then please don't sit like that, sit cross-legged. And um, I always strap myself in when I sit in Varasana so that I don't have to work as hard. So I place the strap underneath of my knees, my shins and over the tops of my thighs and then I tighten it up so that I can really like release outward into the strap. And you don't have to sit like this. We're gonna be here for about 10 minutes. So, well, not 10 minutes, I have five minutes. You're gonna be here for five minutes. <laughs> so if that's too long for you to sit in Varasana, don't do it. And then either make two cups in your palms or make one giant chalice with the back of one hand in the palm of the other, thumbs touching and close your eyes or close them nine tenths of the way. And bring your tongue to the top of your palate, the place where you would say the word love or library or listen and open up the thread of your imagination so that you have a very formal seat supported from the base upward through the crown of the head Open up the peristalsis, the soft baby spot at the top of the head and imagine a golden thread was descending from the universal above you all the way down into the molten core of the planet down the perineum. Establish yourself in the ground of being, your sacred feet on holy ground. And feel the counterbalance between the tongue at the top of the palate and the perineum plugged into a socket, drawing currency and information up from the core of the planet. Be receptive to the universe above and then to the piece of you that's below, you're sitting on the throne of the earth. And it's like there's an octave above you and an octave below you and you're playing the melody in between. Connect your hearing to your breathing so that you're connecting your lungs to your kidneys, that oceanic tide of the breath and put a little ujjayi breath on it. So that little constriction at the back of the throat that makes it sound like you're fogging a mirror. 
with the mouth closed. It's gracious. And in between those two things is that third hand that we've talked about, this invisible part of you that's mediating universal and personal, mediating your inheritance and your education, mediating grace and effort, mediating the memory behind you and the potential that's always there in front of you. So expand in every direction on your next in breath, up and down, forward and back, left and right. And as you exhale, reconcile all of that, the center of yourself. So when you breathe in, you're finding the depth of your depths and the height of your heights, all of your feelings, all of the, your education, it's all mediated at the center on the exhale. Now touch your index finger to your thumb and stretch your arms up. And if you have shoulder problems, you're welcome, of course, to keep the hands in the lap like two cups. Otherwise, make a V in your arms so your biceps are alongside of your ears. Lift your chin. Take the lungs forward one more time. And we're going to pump out a couple of bati breath because we just built a cup with all of our asana. And now it's like we want to turn on the water hose outside on full blast so that it, so it's like pumping water out of the pipe. So start to forcefully snap your navel point back and exhale. If it's new to you, you can go slow. If you know this practice well, this shot karma, this purification technique, then you can pump, pump, pump a little bit faster. And I want you to imagine it's again a garden hose and you're turning up the water so you can feel the currency moving through you from the tongue to the palate to the finger and the thumb. All of these place, places in the body are conducting currency. So I want you to take a hundred breaths here so that you set a goal in the center of the back of your mind. And as you pump, I'm going to take you through your personal abode one more time. So as you're pumping your breath, take your imagination down to your perineum. And then go up to the back of your right eye. And then go around your back to your left armpit. And then go up to the front of your left eye, pumping your breath. and down to the center of yourself and down to your right sitting bone and up to your right armpit around your back to your left sitting bone last bit of breath up to the third eye center inhale hook your thumbs Squeeze the sex organs, the navel point, lift up, up, up like a tube of toothpaste, holding your breath. And now pop your cork, bring your fingertips to the earth. Bring the backs of your hands to your thighs. And just watch the breath for a moment. Tide moving in, tide moving out. We play our anxieties with Kapalabhati. We play ascending a mountain, going up to the place where the air gets thin. We play seducing ourselves out of our habits. If you always do everything the same way and you're unwilling to speed up or unwilling to go places you've never been before, it's how we become a stick in the mud. And there's days we have to mediate that when we're unwell or like Kapalabhati isn't for every day, right? If there's a day, it's not for nighttime. It's not when you're sick. Right. So we play knowing what tool we're playing with and when to play with it. And the more options you have for your behavior, the more powerful you are. So we learn to heat ourselves up and cool ourselves down and slow down time and speed it up. Put yourself at the invisible steering wheel in your car because body's a house that travels. So it's not just a house, it's a vehicle. So you are right at the center of yourself. And once again, know you have a ground of being below you your first nature, primal self. And then know you have a second floor of doing left hand, right hand, your chest, your capacity. And then know you have a third floor, which is your vision, your antenna, 360 degrees of ability. And know you have a memory behind you, a back, 
and you have potential in front of you. You have a left side, you have your heart and your community and your communication, and you have a right side that makes deals in the world. You have your liver of experience and the innocence of your heart. And you are right at the center, mediating in all directions like a stick fighter, holding at the center, the sphere, center of your circumference, mediator, modulator, meditator. So organize yourself right at the center one more time. Be formal and formidable. And then take your hands in front of your face and rub your palms together really vigorously. And get heat, heat, heat between your palms. And then cup your palms over your eyes with your fingertips on your hairline. Soften the muscles of the eyes so the eyeball sits in the socket like a ball in a mitt. And then gently open your eyes behind your hands, let in the dark. Release your palms, let in the light. And welcome yourself back from your practice. <laughs>